Hi, everybody. We are live. Welcome to the Killer Author Club. We're so excited you guys are here. So um, we have the one and only fabulous Jean Kwok, the New York Times bestselling author of Searching for Sylvia Lee and Girl in Translation. Today we'll be talking about her new release, The Leftover Woman, that's out a week from today, an evocative family drama and riveting mystery about the ferocious pull of motherhood for two very different women. We have a ton to talk to Jean about, and I'm sure you guys do too. So grab your copy, your cocktail, your list of questions for Jean, and we'll see you on the flip side. Guys. Hi, Heather. Hi, Hi, Heather. Hi. Hi. I'm my hair. I, I, my Wi-Fi is not good. I'm working. Here we go. I'll put it. Here it comes. Thought you really loved me. Guess I was wrong. Thought you'd never leave me. Guess I was dumb. Waited like forever to be your plus one. But I guess you were done. Left me at the Hi, everybody. We're back. And we keep uh, losing one of the killers, but don't worry, she'll be back. I'm sure she will. It's a live show, so things happen. Anyway, I am Kara Ruda, along with founding members Kimberly Bell and maybe Heather Gunkoff back at some point. <laughs> and we're so excited to welcome Jean to the Killer <laughs> Club. The Killer's nice to the Killer Club could interact with some of the best suspense and thriller authors in the business. Killers like Patricia Cornwell. Yes, she's coming on. Sarah Pekinen, Brita McFadden, Angie Kim, Vanessa Lilly, and so many more. Dates, times, and all of the more details can be found at killerauthorclub.com. But today we're here with Killer Jean to talk about killing of the fictional kind, of course. So make sure you drop all of your questions in the comments and we will try to get to as many as we can. If you're watching this on Facebook, check out our private group, Killer Author Clubhouse, where you can have special content like book clubs that are coming up and so much more. We also have a YouTube channel, and I think we're up to maybe 400,000, no, no, not maybe that many <laughs> <laughs> viewers on YouTube, but we would love for you guys to subscribe there too. Okay, so without further ado, Kimberly, would you please introduce our killer guest? I would be honored to. My friend Jean Kwok is the New York Times and internationally best-selling author of Girl in Translation and Mumbo in Chinatown. Her work has been published in 20 countries and is taught in universities, colleges, and high schools across the world. She's been selected for numerous honors, including the American Library Association Alex Award, the Chinese American Librarians Association Best Book Award, and the Sunday Times EFG Short Story Award International Shortlist. She received her bachelor's degree from Harvard University and earned an MFA from Columbia, so she's real dumb. Yeah. <laughs> she's fluent in Chinese. <laughs> Nederlands Dutch and English and divides her time between the Netherlands and New York City. Welcome, Jean. Hey. So glad to see you. <laughs> Hi, guys. Thank you so much for having me. This is like the funnest thing ever to be an honorary killer. So thank you. Thank you, my dears, for letting me be here. <laughs> We are so excited to be talking tonight about The Leftover Woman, which I love. Can you give us a quick little elevator pitch for The Leftover Woman? We're going to talk about it a lot more, but just quickly tell us what it's about. It, the Leftover Woman is about what happens when a young Chinese woman in China gives birth and is told shortly afterwards that her baby had died. But she finds out a few years later that her daughter had not died, but been placed for adoption by her no good husband to a wealthy American couple, another casualty of China's one child policy. And when the book opens, she has followed her daughter to New York City to get her baby back. Mm, I loved it, you guys. It's so good. And we're going to talk a lot more about it. In just a minute, but for now, everyone, let's settle in for the killer cocktail of this episode. Yes. So the hunter. Can you tell us more about this, uh, Jean? Why did you choose this uh, beautiful drink as your 
cocktail tonight? Well, because um, the Hunter College High School Alumni Association is co-sponsoring my launch at the Strand mm. next week on Tuesday. For people who are there on New York City, the Hunter is their drink. I went to Hunter High School. And what this means for people who are in New York and could possibly make it to my launch is that it's going to be so fancy schmancy. I mean, it's like not due to me at all. But thank you to the great Hunter Alumni Association for having it fully catered with an open bar. And you do have to buy tickets, but basically the tickets are like the price of the book plus a couple of bucks. So um, in honor of Hunter and like my legacy in Hunter and, you know, they're going to be serving the Hunter there um, and so on that, I, you know, and it's also a really delicious cocktail. And I thought it fit in thematically with killers and predators and, you know, hunting down the killer and the victims. Hunting whichever. down her daughter. Sorry, we happen to be exactly hunting down her daughter that it seemed like the perfect drink for our Killer Author Club tonight. I love it. And I already actually put it on killerauthorclub.com killer so you can find the recipe there if it Jeez. flashed by too quickly for you guys. Yeah. Well, Jean, you know, congratulations on all your success so far and the success to come with this book. I just want to say, you guys, if you don't know already, The Leftover Woman is a most anticipated book by The New York Times. L, People, New York Post, Goodreads, Crime Reads, Library Reads, and everyone else. Okay, um, Laura Dave said it's a magnetic meditation on secret histories, motherhood, love, and how we show up for each other in the most surprising of ways. Isn't that beautiful? A beautiful proposal story. And let's see, I'm, I'm more, wait, there's more. Sorry, hold on, my pages are sticking up. Okay. Um, <laughs> The Lives of Two Women, a privileged book editor and a Chinese immigrant navigating Manhattan's underworld collide in the emotion-packed thriller, says People magazine. And finally, book list Star Review says, Kwok brings her signature lyrical prose to the novel while suspense simmers in the background. I love that one too. Anyway, so Jean, congratulations on all of that. But the pressing question that we really want the answer to is, where do you kill? <laughs> <laughs> well, that is a really, really complicated drink. By the way, should I have a sip of my cocktail? Or is oh, there yeah, like a cocktail yeah, here, moment? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I made sure I had my Ooh, cocktail here. Yes. That's gorgeous. Yes, indeed. It's it a purple. You can, it's hard, to, it's hard to see here, but oh my gosh. Oh, mm, yeah. so good. Okay, so, so, so um, I no 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 I I need like like a drink before I kill. I <laughs> I actually like to kill in bed guys. So <laughs> I was like what what could be better? Maybe that's why I'm actually getting divorced. But um, <laughs> but yes, I have, you know, I have my laptop and I love I'm one of those writers like I love working in bed and the more I know you're not supposed to, it's supposed to be like the worst thing ever for your sleep. And actually, it's true that I am really bad at sleeping, but I don't know if that's because I kill in bed or <laughs> and I don't know if that's relevant or not, but I still do because it's just my favorite place to write. And honestly, a lot of times, you know, sometimes in bed you wind up sliding down too far. So I have a couch, I now have a couch where I have set up, um like a little like small bedside table and I've got a huge iMac screen on it. I've got actually dual monitor set up and an independent cable, but I am on a couch with like a blanket and my like cozy crystals and aromatherapy oil to be just to like soothe the anxiety. You um, and you know, that's why I think up all my plots. Yeah. Will you take yeah. pictures of your setup sometime for us? I totally will. Yes, yeah. I will. I am not at home. I'm not at home now, guys. I am in a hotel room. So um, I just went to the New England Independent Booksellers Association uh, event tonight. And I was like, thank you, thank you, thank you. I have to go on the Kill Arthur Club. Bye, guys. <laughs> and then I raced back to my hotel. And uh, so here I am. You guys are seeing me live um, from my hotel. But yes, I would love to show you guys pictures at some point. Yeah. So, so you can kill in bed in a hotel room as well. So that's kind of good. You can really kill it anywhere that has a bed. I like it. 
Right. You can, absolutely. Yep. All right, so we should get to the questions for the leftover women, I think. I mean, I think to me, like, the most poignant part of this book is, I mean, even from the beginning, when you have your author's note, you write about um, the fact that women have to pay a price for men's desires. And it's that whole, the phrase that you use at the beginning of that kind of, to me, sets up everything. I mean, of course, it's also that you're writing about the interplay of East and West and so many huge social topics come to play in between uh, kind of embodying these two women. But how did you get the idea for this story? And, and um, I don't know, just, just give us like, and I know it's really close to your heart too. No, absolutely. And it's so fun, like talking to this audience, but also talking to three killer authors, um, <laughs> because I know that we all kind of come at this from a different place. And, you know, Kimberly actually is somebody who helped me with this book when I got stuck and I was just like, hey, my twist isn't working. What do I do? And, you know, we all know Kimberly is brilliant at plotting and pacing. And she's like, OK, this is all right. You can do it. You know, you just need to kind of fix this there and there and there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, for me, I think every, I'm really curious what you guys think, actually. But like for me, a, a book starts with a feeling. You know, some people start with an idea. Some people start with a character. With me, it starts with a feeling. And I guess, you know, the feeling that this one started with is that I am the youngest of seven children. I am clearly like not male. And, you know, in the Chinese hierarchy where like men and age are the, you know, the determining factors of how high you are, I was like at the lowest end of the low. And growing up in a very traditional Chinese family, I really, you know, I wasn't allowed to do a lot of things. I wasn't allowed to took back, uh, talk back. I wasn't allowed to even look like, you know, look my father in the eyes, you know, because I was disobedient. And mm -hmm. that type of feeling of being oppressed was the beginning of the story. And then, you know, came Jasmine, who is the young woman I talked about, who's got the, you know, who has the child and has the child taken away from her, the birth mother. But the other part of the book is told by Rebecca. And Rebecca is, you know, like all of us, she's like, well, not all of us, but she's smart, she's successful, she's ambitious, and she's trying to juggle all these balls, you know, and she's being judged so harshly, because she's a woman, basically. And of course, she makes mistakes, but her heart's in the right place. And she loves her adopted Chinese daughter so much. And that intersection of like my own feeling and those two characters really created the whole, um, the whole story. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. And by the way, the twist that we talked about, I had, it, because we talked about it like probably a year or two ago, right? I mean, it's been a minute and I'm reading and I'm like, huh? huh? And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, that's it. That's the twist. You nailed it. You nailed it. it. You did I it. Love it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. With a little help from my friends, right? Um, so. Yeah. And so, yeah, and you know that that feeling of oppressiveness, you you really uh, relay that in your beautiful writing. And, you know, we feel it just like sitting on our chest there. And in writing the two perspectives, how did you handle that? Did you do one perspective all the way through and then come back and, and do the, you know, Rebecca's? Or did you go back and forth between Jasmine? And you know, that's such an interesting question. I, I bet every author tax that kind of thing differently. I like I really need to write an order because if I don't write an order, I just have no idea what's going on. So I switched, I alternated a point of view as I was writing the first draft. But I do have to say that there were times when I only in the rewrite when I only looked at Jasmine's story, and then there are times when I only looked at Rebecca's, just to make sure I had the voice right, that I had the timing right, that I wasn't dropping one of them for too long. And in the original draft, I had the uh, the chapters like really alternating. So like Jasmine, Rebecca, Jasmine, Rebecca, Jasmine, Rebecca. But then 
like at a certain point, it was just really, really hard to do. It wasn't natural to the story because I had to break the story in weird places because of that thing. And some of the people were like, what the heck is this Rebecca? Like at the beginning when you don't really get what the story is about, they're like, what is she doing there? Why is she there? And mm -hmm. so I finally realized, I was like, no, I don't actually, it's not like mathematics. Like I don't need to be like, <laughs> alternating I, I as long as I, I think you shouldn't wait too long to introduce the second point of view so that the reader isn't thrown off but if you introduce it pretty fast you know you can kind of just cut at the best possible space and that's what I wound up doing yeah I yeah. love that. that gives us the freedom as a writer to you know play with structure and yeah you know, do what's best we think is best for the character. So I love that. And I, you know, I know I'm working, what I'm working on, just hearing you say that gives me permission that I can, me too. I can keep like <laughs> chapter three, four with the same perspective. And when yeah. I saw that, I'm like, that's brilliant. I, you know, I had these rules I was making my, for myself that I didn't need to have. Yeah. But yeah. I appreciate yeah. it. Exactly. Ditto. Ditto. And the bit about getting their, um, getting their voices like not mixed up, but just making sure that they sound very different. You know, you do have to almost like put one aside and work on one, whether it's edits or drafting or whatever. And then, uh, cause it's hard when there are two women who are, I mean, I realized that these two had very different backgrounds, but they're the same age. They're, you know, um, mothering or wanting to mother the same kid, you know, I mean, it's, 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 yeah, it's difficult, right? To keep them separate. Right. And to Phyllis's question, which character was easier for you to yeah. write? You know, it's really funny because Jasmine came to me first, right? And Jasmine, of course, is a kind of a more primal connection to me. And you would think that she would be by far the easiest because, of course, we're both Chinese American. We both had the same kind of experience. But in some ways, she was hard, too, because she grows up in rural China. And I grew up in, you know, I grew up in Hong Kong and in New York City. So, like, to do rural China well was so difficult because I couldn't, I just couldn't get the facts. It was during COVID. I couldn't go there by myself. And, you know, there's a lot of writing nonfiction about Beijing. There are a lot of people from Beijing, from like Singapore, from like the big cities in Asia. You can get a lot of information. But to get the truth about what it really was like to grow up in a small rural village in China was actually extremely difficult. And I wound up um, finally finding a, um, finally finding a Cambridge professor who had done like years of field research and had written about it and talking to her and interviewing her about the stuff that didn't make it into her books to get a real idea of day to day. What are the dynamics? What are young people doing? Can you get away with drinking? Would everybody know, you know, those kind of things to get that right um, in that story. So Jasmine was really challenging in that way. And then Rebecca, you know, Rebecca is white. So of course I'm not white. And Rebecca is affluent and wealthy, and I'm sadly not affluent, and was definitely not born to wealth. Um, but, you know, she is a modern woman who is successful and ambitious and trying to juggle the demands of motherhood and a relationship, a marriage, and her career. And, oh, my God, I could so identify with her. And, you know, I remember, like, when my – when I – my baby was little. I was on the airplane with my husband and he changed the baby's diaper. And oh my God, like to hear the flight attendants, it was like the second coming, you know? You know, it was like, it was like, oh, the Messiah has come, you know, the man changed the diaper. And I'm like, oh, hello, you know, how, how many diapers have I changed? Like nobody's cheering and ooing over me. Um, no. So, yeah, so that, that was, Rebecca was very easy to write in a lot of ways because I identified so much with her and I love both of them equally. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. Okay, I have a question over here, which is similar to a lot of the questions going by. Did you always want to be an author? And another person asked if you weren't an author, what would you be? So 
you know, that kind of question. <laughs> well, so, you know, I, um, I was, yeah. So basically I, um, I did not know I wanted to be an author. Like I loved to read and I was like the biggest reader from the moment I learned English, but I'm a first generation immigrant. We were working class and way poor, like really so poor that the apartment we had in Brooklyn did not have a working central heating system. You know, for most of my childhood, I worked in like a clothing factory in Chinatown as a kid for after school for most of my life from the time I was five years old. So like my only goal in life, my friends, was to like get a job. It was not, you know, I had no artistic ambitions. I didn't even know it was possible to write a book. Like I, I didn't know, like I loved books, but it, you know, people who wrote them were in the stratosphere. Um, mm. And I just never ever dreamed about anything like that. So it was really like one night I was in college and I was a physics major because I was going to just have, a, I just wanted to escape life at the factory. It was my only goal. And I was like doodling and writing, you know, trying to figure out this really difficult problem set. And it was like, I, I wrote a poem and I just like stared at my hand like, what was that? <laughs> what was that? And then I like, I realized, oh, I could write something creative, like as opposed to a you know, a paper, an English paper or something. I was like, I can actually write creative things. And then it was the strangest thing. I don't know if you guys, I'm curious if you guys had the same experience, but like from that moment on, I only wanted to be a writer. Like, even though I wasn't going to really like finish a book for many years, it was the only, only thing I wanted to do. Like only thing. Was that, can I just ask the other killers? Was that, was it like that for you guys? <laughs> I knew since third grade, so I didn't have to go into really? physics to find out, which was lucky because I would not have survived going into physics to find out. But yeah, I, I kinda, that was kind of my dream. Yeah, I had a professor, father, and a teacher, mom, and I just grew up around books, and I just love books, and I wanted to, I wanted to do books. Yeah, yeah. How about you, Kimberly? Yeah, it took me longer. I was, um, I had a, a full career before this one and working in nonprofits and, and really enjoyed it, but, you know, missed that creative thing. And it was kind of a secret dream for a lot of years. And then um, I got laid off from my job in 2008 when everything, everybody was getting laid off everywhere. And uh, I was like, well, maybe this is the universe giving me a nudge. So, um, yeah, so that's when I started writing. Yeah, and I, I had first I'd wanted to be a teacher ever since I was like in uh, first grade. And so I that's what I became. And so I, I didn't step away t from education until about three years ago. So, wow. I didn't realize that you were a teacher. In wow. Classroom, but I was serving in our district as uh, a teacher leader. And oh, so, wow. um, yeah. And so but I've always loved to write. And, yeah. you know, I was lucky enough to do two things I love. So yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. really lucky that way. Yeah. All right. Wow. Guys, and I, I do just want to say that, I mean, we're moving, I, I know we have to move over. I do want to say that, you know, I obviously the people watching this are all fans of you guys, but you three are like three of the most incredible writers ever with such beautiful propulsive books that I'm you're just incredibly inspiring um and it's phenomenal to be on the show with you and oh uh, thank you but also yeah. you know get all of the killers books because <laughs> they are so amazing and like unputdownable just yeah. unputdownable anyway oh, so. And ditto, ditto. Hey, and we have to, we do need to move to the next segment, but I can't let this go by without asking you quickly about banned books, because this is banned books week, and I know that it's a big thing to you. So tell us about why, why that's such an important topic for you. Right. Well, so my debut novel was Girl in Translation, which is, you know, taught in schools around the world. And it's about a young Chinese American girl who really has very much the same life I had as a kid where she works in a factory 
and you know like lives in an apartment without heat and it's just a, like a coming of age story about her she falls in love with two guys one from her exclusive private school one from her from the factory world and she has to kind of choose not only which boy she's going to be with but who she herself is going to be that book is taught in schools and of course it's being challenged and um I I, when I found out it was being challenged in Central Bucks, Pennsylvania, I flew down to defend it in person and that defense has gone viral. And in fact, as a part of my book tour, um, they are sending me back into that town to do an event the night before my New York launch. So if any of you are near Doylestown, Pennsylvania, next Monday, October 9th, I'm going to be doing an event right in the town where they attempted to ban uh, my debut novel. And it would be great if you came. <laughs> like, really, it would be really, really great to have a um, supportive friends there. So, yes, yes. Wow. That's we'll so great. You and it's so important. We'll be with you in spirit. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Amazing. Go get him, Jean. Yes. <laughs> okay. So speaking of the leftover woman, Jean and her publisher are giving away three early copies. It's not out until next week, but we've got three copies. All you have to do to enter is answer this question about our guest, and we will be choosing a winner from all the correct answers. Bonus points for joining the Killer Author Clubhouse, which is our private Facebook group, or subscribing and or subscribing to our YouTube channel. Jean is fluent in which three languages? English, Chinese, and what could it be? What could it be? If you guys are listening. <laughs> Awesome. All right. So drop that in the comments and we will be coming back tomorrow around this time to pick a winner. Three winners. Three winners. Yeah. Okay. I think they got it. Okay. Yep. <laughs> I'm seeing they're they listening. It's awesome. And as everyone knows, the authors love independent booksellers and booksellers everywhere. And um, we do our best to support them. And I know, Jean, that you picked as your killer bookseller of the week, Strand, um, which is in New York. Can you tell us why this uh, bookstore is important to you? Well, you know, I love Strand because I, um, it was just, it's been around for so long. And I remember walking by it as a kid and kind of browsing through it as a teenager, going there with my friends. Um, and it's just such a kind of beautiful, wonderful place. They are hosting my event, uh, my launch event in New York next Tuesday on October 10th. So yeah, if you know, if you are in the area, you can get a ticket and actually come celebrate with me on that day. But they are also, they also created a special link that you guys are going to share for signed books so that um, you won't just get a copy of the book, but you will get a copy that is has actually been signed by me they cannot be personalized i'm sorry because they just can't handle that but you know i am going to go in and sign those books so strand is just a venerable institution that's done so much for authors for so many many years and there's the opportunity to get a signed book from them yeah it's a great store what is it they say it's like six miles of books or something like that <laughs> yeah it's incredible Incredible. And I just dropped the link in the comments so you can uh, follow that and get yourself a signed book. And now I think we're doing the celebrates. Are we? I think it is. Okay. So we're okay. So we can't have everybody on that would like to be on. And we're so sorry about that. And hopefully I'm on the right segment guys <laughs> anyway, but instead we wanted to be sure to give a shout out to a couple of special authors and their books that are coming out this week. So the first one is Penance by Eliza Clark. Joan Wilson was just 16 years old when the three of her peers, girls she went to school with, set her on fire. Nearly a decade after the crime rocked its rundown seaside town on the Yorkshire coast, journalist Alec Carelli has arrived to write an in-depth report of the largely forgotten attack. It's a deeply chilling novel unraveling the devastating murder of a teenage schoolgirl. And Eliza is giving away two coffees. So if you're interested, um, drop a comment in the, in, the, in the comments about that book if you'd like to read Penance. Also, we're celebrating Kill Show by Daniel Swearin Becker. 
After 16-year-old violin prodigy Sarah Parcell disappears into thin air, a viral plea for help brings Hollywood to her family's Maryland doorstep. Sensing a golden opportunity, producer Cassie Hawthorne wins over the desperate parcels with her game-changing concept, Searching for Sarah. Casey's bold pitch, let the world help you find your daughter and get paid for it. Interesting. Okay, so that's Kill Show. If you're interested in reading that too, there's a copy of that for a giveaway too. Love it. Okay, mm -hmm. it's me, right? Um, yep. So... We have, okay, swag giveaway. Membership has its privileges, you guys. Every episode, we choose a name from the clubhouse hat to win a piece of swag. We've got t-shirts, mugs, candles, totes, hats, all of which can be found at killerauthorclub.com. And tonight's winner is Robin Stuhl. Please send one of the killers your address and we will send some killer author swag your way. Yay. Yay. All right. Do we have, is it time? It's time. It's, it's time. time. So, Jean, we are happy to tell you <laughs> that you, in fact, have survived the Killer Author Club. <laughs> and, and, you know, a prize, a token. Uh, we have this lovely badge. That <laughs> so upon you, and you can put it up there on the wall with all your other accolades. Um, but congratulations, and we are so glad that you could be here with us. I love it. I love it. Thank you guys so much. I wish I could be with you every single week because it's just <laughs> to be among three such talented, wonderful women. It's just the best joy ever. And okay. thanks so much to everyone who tuned in too. It's been, I haven't, we're not able to, I'm not able to just totally respond because I just not that coordinated, but it's so <laughs> thrilling to see, to see everyone and to see your comments and everything. So thank you. Yeah. Okay, Jean, you could be back every week. It makes everyone feel so happy to have you. So thank you so much. And I guess that does it for tonight's episode of the Killer Author Club. Thank you for tuning in, everybody. And special thanks to Jean and your heartfelt loveliness for being here. And congratulations on your next bestseller. Okay, on October 17th, beginning at 8 Eastern, we have our next book club with Christina McDonald, and we'll be discussing these still black waters, about which Kimberly Bell said, a whip smart, completely unexpected story of a killer out for revenge and a damaged detective out to stop them. This is the book, you, it's not the book you think it is, and I mean that in the best possible way. And remember, Killer Author Book Club is exclusive to the Killer Author Clubhouse on Facebook, so you have to be a member, so come join us there but that's not all. Okay, one, one week from today, we're back with the only one and only Sarah Pekinen and her book, Gone Tonight. So right here, October 10th at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 Pacific. For full time, full schedule, past episodes, merch, and all of that, go to killerauthorclub.com. And thanks again for tuning in. Have a good night. And wait, 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 wait. Oh. Surprise, like a, a, a big announcement, breaking news. Don't we? Do we have a special <laughs> killer author coming on? We do. We do. Ha we have a big author coming, which um, Kara kind of announced when you um, Wait, when you were gone. Patricia Cornwell, y'all. Yeah. She is coming, Ooh. and we and that's the breaking news, which already broke at the beginning of the episode. But you were not here for that. <laughs> That's what happens when I get kicked off the show and then try to come back on. <laughs> I think we're done for the night. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's always a seamless process, but that's why you oh. tune into live shows. They're so seamless. Okay. Uh, I think we everybody. Yeah. <laughs> <in> here. <laughs> I, I guess I